uh, right after Thanksgiving and going uh, throughout the month of December. I believe um, it's been going for six years. And we'll tell a little bit more about that in the presentation, how we got involved. It's definitely grown um, over those six years. Okay, it looks like it is um, time for us to begin. So I want to welcome everybody today. Um, you are at this session about the Dickens Project. Uh, the Dickens Project exemplifies virtual collaboration, which is key to virtual worlds. Um, I'm Dr. Valerie Hill, and I'm the director of the Community Virtual Library. And my colleagues, uh, Brianna Theodore with, um, with her MLS and Dr. Mary Pat Lynch, they will introduce themselves um, as we go along with our presentation today. Our presentation today will share the best practices for collaborating, which is key in virtual worlds, to provide high quality immersive experiences. Uh, we believe it requires a variety of skills, and not a single one of us has all of the skills that are necessary alone to create and build high quality immersive learning environments that are filled with authentic and accurate content. So our goal today, we hope to show the necessity of collaboration among educators, builders, librarians, instructional designers, everybody working as a team in order to provide a high quality immersive experience. So the Shawnee Library, and that's how you pronounce it, Shawnee, um, created the Dickens Project in Second Life in 2013 and has presented it annually for the past six years, um, every year during the month of December. And the project focuses on Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol, which is great over the holiday season, and uh, it includes live readings of A Christmas Carol. It also shares uh, a lot of content on the Victor Victorian era, and people can dress in that attire. The Community Virtual Library and Shawnee Library, we've had a partnership for years and years. In fact, we shared land and resources in the past. In 2016, Judy Cullen, the uh, leader of the Shawnee Library and the director of the, the Dickens Project, um, Callie, you might know her, Caledonia Sky Tower in Second Life, she contacted um, me and the, and the Community Virtual Library with an idea. She sh suggested that we build a resource center at the Dickens Project, sort of a virtual library that would share research, re research projects that would enhance um, the Dickens Project. So the Community Virtual Library sent out a call for proposals to all of the educational groups and, uh, and students in virtual worlds in, in Second Life through emails and listservs and, and other uh, communication channels um, to tell them and give them the call for proposal for research projects on, this, uh, on the Dickens Project. Then the CVL Dickens Resource Center was built with eight research projects that first year. And since then, it has continued to expand year after year. So what we want to share today is the roles that are needed to use virtual worlds for immersive learning, because they include teachers that understand the best practices and the curriculum needs of the students. It includes builders with the skills necessary to create aesthetically pleasing environments, not some of those with neon flashing things that you know, look all crazy. And not everyone has those skills. Um, and so you need the builders. And then you also need instructional designers that can embed the content 
right into the experience. So today, we're going to share three different perspectives on collaboration that are essential to constructive learning in virtual world projects, such as this one, the, the Dickens Project. So first, I'll share my perspective as the librarian, and then Brianna, that's uh, Jody Landon here in Second Life, she will share the builder's perspective, and um, Mary Pat, that's Eva, uh, will share the game designer's perspective um, of collaborating for this project. So as a librarian, as the director of um, the Community Virtual Library, my role included curating and collecting the research projects and all of the library resources that would be centered on Charles Dickens and the Victorian era. My job also included co um, coordinating with the Shawnee Library Project Director, Callie, um, Judy Cohen, all of the educational groups in virtual worlds, and then also coordinating with the builder and the game designer at the, the Dickens Project, and then also providing planning live events and tours. So each year that we've been involved, and that's three years now we've done this, CVL has hosted a minimum of three tours during the month, um, engaging educational groups to come and attend the many daily events that are offered at the Dickens Project. And live events and tours are what make virtual worlds dynamic. Sure, you can go all by yourself and see the Dickens Project, but it's much better when you experience it with others. So during the live tours um, to the CVL Dickens Resource Center, the researchers that came up with these projects and, share, and shared them, uh, they were given an opportunity to talk about it and share their research topic, just like you would at a physical research symposium. Um, a researcher on Disability in Dickens Literature, Reflections of the Victorian Era's Ambivalent Attitudes Toward Disability, it, um, that led to a discussion on attitudes that, that have extended to today about you know, disabilities that we still have today. The research projects are on display throughout the month so that they can be revisited um, to dig deeper into those or if someone's particularly interested in a, in a certain one. Um, the participants of the tour are led through the research projects and then on to the Dickens Library to receive many of Dickens' works in digital formats so they can actually click on books and, and take them into their inventory and, and read them. When Caledonia first came to me with the idea of research projects, she suggested topics such as what disease might Tiny Tim have actually been suffering from? Or what were the working conditions really like in London during that time period? Or what kind of food you know, was available? Were they, were they healthy, eating you know, nutritious foods? So af over these past three years, researchers have added things like topics like debtors' prisons, medicine and health care, Dickens and the law, we had a law librarian present that one. Clothing in the Victorian era, architecture, um, and archival practices then and now. Dickens' A Christmas Carol has become a holiday classic that we all love. And some of the traditions of the era um, embedded into the story at, are embedded in our lives. Um, some people have credited um, Dickens with inventing our holiday traditions. <laughs> um, but actually, he was writing exactly at the right time because there was a revival of customs underway and the research projects shared um, the foods popular during the Victorian era. And although, for example, sugar was a rare treat because there was a high um, sugar tax, at Christmas time, special treats like Christmas crackers became popular. Dickens was a foodie, we might say. He shared tons of descriptions about food, such as the food described when, um, when Scrooge meets the ghost of, of Christmas present. He says, heaped on the floor to form a kind of throne were turkeys, geese, game, poultry, brawn, great joints of meat, sucking pigs, long wreaths of sausages, mint pie, mince pies, plum puddings, barrels of oysters, red hot chestnuts, cherry-cheeked apples. 
The Community Virtual Library also partners with a library called the Antique Pattern Library, and both CVL and APL are projects of New Media Arts. I'll put that in the text chat. The Antique Pattern Library is an online catalog of old manuscripts and patterns and materials, and they contributed um, materials to the Dickens Project to help create authenticity. Because um, historical experience in virtual worlds often include clothing and attire for a particular historical era. So CVL is striving to collect resources about authentic historical clothing and patterns to, to help people who want to do role play that's accurate be able to find these things. For example, uh, chairs, clothing, slippers, draperies, um, and all of these were created with intricate embroidered patterns that can be found um, at the APL online. Of course, it's not always possible to be completely accurate. We're not the costume police here you know, um, with every historical detail. But I think as educators advocating the evaluation of historical accuracy and then understanding that importance um, as educators, that's modeling best, best practices, and that's important for students. Even just talking about the inaccuracies that we might see, that somebody's wearing something that wouldn't fit in that historical period, that can be a real learning experience for our students. Conversations about um, immersive learning and the challenges that we all face as educators, that took place at the Dickens Project as we were going throughout the tours we would discuss these kinds of things and the best practices for historical role play. And some of the challenges that we discussed included um, how to archive this, this digital content um, and you know year after year as the, the project is built and then on into the future. Um, and this is a, an important goal for librarians that the CVL librarians are working on, archival of digital content. We're going to have a room in the Digital Citizenship Museum on that topic. Um, we're also working on collecting uh, the best, best practices through machinima and exploring various file formats for archival in the future. So as we look to the future, our goals uh, for the Dickens Project 2019, because we certainly want to continue partnering on this amazing educational experience, our goals include an expansion of the CVL Resource Center with more research projects. So contact me later if you're interested in anything to do with that time period and, and you'd like to get involved. Also, um, continued connectivity with educational groups so that we they can find out about this and, and, and share you know, what's been done and what we're doing, as well as plans for um, additional live events for educators, students, and anyone is interested in historical virtual environments. So I'm going to turn the presentation over now to Brianna. That's Jody Landon. I enjoyed working with her so much. She's also the lead curator librarian for the nonprofit Commons Research um, resource uh, library here at Second Life. So Jody, I'll let you take away um, the slides at this time. Great, thanks Val. Let me get all set up here. All right, we should be all set here. Okay, so my name is Brianna Theodore, or just Bree. Most people call me Bree. Um, and I'm a graduate of San Jose State University's Master of Library and Information Science program. Um, before grad school, um, I'd actually been building in Second Life for over four years on a different account. Um, and my involvement with the Community Virtual Library began when I joined my alma mater's uh, SL-based library program, uh, the VCARA program, uh, which stands for the Virtual Center for Archives and Records Administration. And through VCARA, uh, I met Val and became involved with the Community Virtual Library as a reference librarian uh, and a builder. 
pretty casually at first, but it kind of uh, turned into something else over time, uh, more of a serious sort of position. Um, and I've worked on various building projects in the last year and a half um, in collaboration with CVL, Vicara, the Dickens Project, and also the Nonprofit Resource Center. Um, I've designed and built conference spaces, interactive exhibits, and a nonprofit resource library. And in that time, I've learned a great deal about what collaboration means on a medium like Second Life. Um, and I've noticed some recurring patterns therein as well. Um, and since building projects, regardless of theme, tend to involve similar processes, um, what follows isn't going to be a step-by-step -step reflection of my personal experience building for the Dickens Project. Um, instead, it's going to be a general description of what building projects tend to entail, um, followed by the unique challenges that come with uh, building in Second Life, um, and the collaborative resources that builders can use to overcome those challenges. So, when building or designing a virtual space, I've learned that collaboration is necessary at nearly every stage in the process. It's also something that kind of emerges naturally out of uh, the building process as well. Um, and so the members of the organizing, oh, sorry, the members of the organization that commission a building project need to first establish a set of guidelines and deadlines for the builder to follow. Normally building projects um, are, are made um, with a particular event in mind. For example, uh, when I was working with the nonprofit resource center, um, they had a particular date in mind that they wanted a new library uh, to be opened by. So, you know, that, that gave us a sort of timeline of um, how quickly the work needed to be done. Uh, anyway, this typically involves having a discussion about the event's theme and forming a timeline for the whole building process, as I've just mentioned. Um, and in order to ensure that the builder's approach to designing a space falls in line with the desires and needs of the commissioning party, a great deal of consistent communication and evaluation is typically required throughout the process. <clears throat> and so for those who may be unfamiliar with this concept, um, building and second life refers to the process of creating objects out of prims. And prims or primitives are 3D shapes that are used as starting points for creating objects in Second Life. Um, and all objects in SL are made of prims that have been manipulated to look like other items like terrain, interior decorations, clothing, vehicles, anything else that you can think of, anything that you see around you right now. And pictured on the screen are the many prim options that can be used as a starting point for building, each with their own particular value and um, uses. And as a builder, you have many options. You can decide to build your own objects, which can be time consuming, or you can find objects created by others and purchase them on the marketplace, which can be expensive. And what you choose may depend on several factors, like the availability of the objects that you need on the marketplace, um, the amount of time that you have to complete the project, and the amount of money that you're able to spend. People who build in Second Life often tend to have very robust inventories filled with items that they've collected over time, uh, a virtual Mary Poppins bag of sorts. In the interest of saving money and time, a builder will often begin the building process by taking note of which appropriate items may already be in their inventory. Uh, for example, for a theme like the Dickens Project, where we're in Victorian England, I may already have in my inventory a kind of antique table, which could maybe work uh, for any variety of themes, you know, so that would kind of save me time in trying to find something like that for designing a space. And pictured here is my own inventory, um, and I've sort of given an example of how I've organized the items that I used to build for the Dickens project. Everything kind of organized into folders so that I can more easily find the things that I need. And so after determining which suitable pieces are already in their possession, a builder will often need to seek out other materials to meet the more idiosyncratic needs of the theme. And at this early stage, collaboration tends to take the form of working with the commissioning party to find out what their vision is for the space and devising a plan of action. 
And for me, a building project always begins by taking a look at the structure that needs to be decorated. Uh, and then from there, I need, I usually bounce ideas off of my graphic designer friend, Amanda Gerardin, pictured above. Uh, she's Brigitte Chabalova in Second Life. Uh, and she has a lot of knowledge about Second Life photography, fashion blogging, and building as well. And I often encounter builders block pretty regularly at the very beginning of a project. So it's extremely helpful to have someone to brainstorm with and to collaborate with who may visualize a space differently than I do. And for the Dickens project, I was tasked with decorating the interior of the CBL Resource Center and the Dickens Library. And a major challenge was the structure of the building itself. As you can see in the picture, um, it was a very large structure with extremely tall walls, pillars, and windows. Um, additionally, it had an industrial feel to it with its steel plated floors and exposed railings. And it was my job to make this space feel warm, welcoming, and holiday like while also facilitating access to the research presentations that the building was meant to display. And receiving feedback from Val and Judy during the building process was crucial in ensuring that I was headed in the right direction. Seeing as the event focused on the Victorian era, another challenge in creating this type of immersive environment was ensuring that the decorative items in the space were as historically accurate as possible, as Val was sort of mentioning briefly earlier. Um, for me, that was a challenge because most of my building projects so far have been quite contemporary in nature and I was entering into unfamiliar territory with the event's Victorian theme. Um, collaboration again comes into play here because in working with Amanda on this project, she demonstrated a substantive knowledge of Second Life-based period decor that was crucial for the design of those spaces. Additionally, collaboration of this sort is particularly important because working within a theme can pose very unique challenges in Second Life. Um, unlike real world event planners, builders in SL are limited by the range of decorative options available for sale on the marketplace, assuming that you don't want to take the time to build those objects that you need yourself. And for example, if a theme is very uncommon, very specific or particularly obscure, those related items will likely be more difficult to find. The marketplace has a notoriously unreliable keyword search mechanism. A common issue with relying on natural language as a mode of subject representation is that languages are very rich and complex. That's to say, we often use different words to describe the same things. A builder seeking out Dickensian decor items on the marketplace using the keyword Dickens may find some relevant items, but they may also find, as pictured above, pools and jacuzzis sold by a shop owner with the word Dickens in their username. Further, relevant items may be missed completely because their respective shop owners perhaps chose to describe those items with keywords that you just hadn't thought to use. Another issue with the marketplace is that many of the items that show up can be very out of date, having been made before the advent of Mesh, which are three models that can allow for more realism than some crim based objects. Complicating things further, shops that sell newer and higher quality decorative items sometimes have no marketplace shops at all. <laughs> they do need librarians. <laughs> uh, some of these new, newer shops um, only exist in world, which of course makes it necessary to first possess knowledge of the shop as well as a landmark before visiting, you know, which isn't great if you're someone who's trying to browse around and find these objects. It's almost impossible if you don't have a source of uh, knowledge from, for example, other builders, which I will get to in just a moment. Yeah, adding a lot of a lot of keywords that you think would help you find the objects that you need sometimes don't really help very much. So I totally agree with you there. Okay, so the obstacles involved in navigating the marketplace can be circumvented by simply communicating with and collaborating with other builders. This can help you to cover your bases as other suggestions may fill the gaps in your own knowledge and then your knowledge may in turn do the same for someone else. One reliable method to get in touch with other builders is to join the free in-world group Love to Decorate as pictured in the, the image on the left side of the screen. 
Uh, LTD is a very well-known home and garden website that promotes the newest decorative items and creations in Second Life. The Emerald Group is extremely active, and I've always received ex like very prompt and helpful responses when asking questions, literally at any time of day, which is kind of nice. Uh, unfortunately, there's also a vibrant community of builders who photograph their designs and share them on their blogs and Flickr pages. They're often very easy to contact and eager to help other builders and have a wonderful source. Have, they've been a wonderful source of in inspiration for me during creative blocks. And what follows are examples of such design. The first builder I'd like to highlight is Kelly Topaz Firehawk, a longtime Second Life photographer and designer of nature-based sets and home interiors. She's kindly given me permission to share some of her beautiful work, and I've included a link to her Flickr page here. Please check her out. She makes extremely beautiful sets and just phot photographs them in such gorgeous ways. Um, she's one of my favorites. Um, and this design, this which is called Road to Autumn, evokes a feeling of seasonal warmth and hominess. Uh, for builders who do a lot of landscaping design, uh, it's great to appreciate the small details that we may normally overlook when entering into a new sim. For example, the slight curve of the dirt road towards the bottom of the image, uh, the careful placement of the fallen autumn leaves below the reddening trees, the tinge of green in the patches of yellowing grass, and etc. These are all things that the builder will have spent hours to set up meticulously and with a particular vision in mind. Here's an example of her home interior designing style and this piece entitled Early Morning Eats. If there's a particular element of her designs that I want to utilize in my own building process, I can either take a look at the styling credits that she's made accessible on her Flickr page or simply contact her in world and ask her for the details that I'm looking for. Yeah, her photos are insane. It's just gorgeous. Um, and next, the next builder I'll be featuring is Devos Titanium, the editor-in-chief of Gallant Magazine, which is a home and garden magazine for Second Life. He builds gorgeous sets and often photographs avatars within them to create specific types of atmosphere. He's graciously allowed me permission to share his incredible work as well, and I'll also be including a link to his Flickr page. His photos are insane as well. Like, please, please take a look at them. Uh, and in this image, which is titled, No One Can Extinguish Your Light, we can see the careful attention to detail and strategically placing several individual items such that the space looks as though it's currently being lived in. And in this image, the perfect tree, we can appreciate not only the gorgeous avatars in the foreground and the details there, such as Devos's avatar holding a red saw, but also the vintage car and natural clustering of trees and signage in the background, all contributing to a feeling of holiday nostalgia. As mentioned previously, focusing on detail is key when seeking inspiration from such talented designers. You can be confident that nothing pictured is extraneous and that every decorative item works towards creating an immersive atmosphere. Gallant Magazine, again, a home and garden and men's fashion magazine, is another great resource for builders. Uh, it's curated and edited by Devos Titanium and releases a quarter annual issue filled with the creative works of SL's top designers, builders, shop owners, and photographers. If I've hit a creative block and know that the space I'm designing needs livening up with greenery or flowers, as an example, I know that Gallant's spring issue will have many options for me. Um, and if, for example, I like the white roses in the corner of the magazine cover on the left side of the screen, or the mirror hanging above the dresser in the second image, I can access the styling credits and learn which shops to purchase them at. Uh, I have a note card, just so you guys know, containing each of these uh, builders' Flickr pages, as well as the link to the Gallant Magazine's website. Um, and I've also put together an introductory guide to some of my go-to shops for purchasing quality decorative items. So if anyone's interested in having this, please feel free to send me an IM and I'd be more than happy to share with you. And so in conclusion, when working on any building project in Second Life, you're bound to encounter any, if not most of the challenges that I've briefly discussed. 
by utilizing the various resources I've just talked about and by interacting with builders who are more experienced in working with a variety of themes, I was able to design a space for the Dickens Project that facilitated in giving visitors a truly immersive experience. Thank you very much. Awesome, thank you so much, um, Jody. And now we'll turn our slides over to Aoife. Thank you, Jody, and thank you, Val. And I, at the moment, it's telling me it has loaded the slides, but they're not coming up. So excuse the moment as I try to. I am seeing my slides, but they're not on the display. Did you click channel A? Ah, I did not. It was set on channel B. <laughs> Thank you. All right, let me get back to the beginning. All right. Welcome, everyone. It is lovely to be here sharing a project that has been important in my life forever. Not literally forever, but 10 years, you know, it's a long time. And I tested this. Now I need a reminder of how to get my text to come up. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Okay. It wasn't. I got it. But it's not at the beginning. All right. This is the difference between testing and actually being on stage. If there is, I don't know it. Here we go. First slide. I am Aoife Lorfield in Second Life and Mary Pat Lynch in Ordinary Life. And as I've said, I am thrilled to be here sharing one segment of my experience with the Dickens Project, which has been dear to my heart since I entered Second Life 10 years ago. It started with the Shanaki Library programs, and we began with a reader's theater production. And you have already heard and seen images of how far we've come. We are immersed in creating immersive experiences. What, you may ask, is a library doing recreating Dickens' London? 
as, again, you've heard not only here but throughout this conference, libraries everywhere are entering the worlds of social media as ways to share information and draw people into worlds of literature. Here in Second Life, we choose to use all the resources we can get our hands on and our heads around. The background I bring is instructional design, faculty development, and educational research. My undergrad and master's degrees were in anthropology and my doctorates in higher education. I worked primarily in medical education, a field that relies totally on simulations, immersion, and hands-on experiences. What better way to bring a Christmas carol to life than to literally immerse visitors in virtual spaces that recreate the shabby schoolhouse, Fezziwig's warehouse, the meanly furnished counting house, and other settings. And we have been working collaboratively within the Shanaki Library community for years to do this under the direction of Caledonia Sky Tower, Judy Collin, who is here in the audience with us today, and have taken this from small builds that would fit on a stage to the full sim recreations of Dickens London that we're doing now. In everything from hands-on projects for children to flight simulators for pilots, we know that immersive experiences work. But Second Life is not a school. Do people learn in Second Life? Of course they do. We do. We all do. But our visitors come for enjoyment, fun, and an experience of a much-loved story presented creatively in beautiful settings. We had to rely on engagement to draw people in. This became part of the design. My part this last year was that I knew I wanted a game to draw on familiar SL experiences like hunts, games, and role play. In addition, we wanted to include story, which is the heart of the Shanaki Library and the Dickens Project. This model became the Urchin Experience, created and implemented for the first time in the 2018 Dickens Project. Why base a game experience around urchins, the poor children who roamed Dickens' London? The plight of children, especially poor children, was central to Dickens' work. Whether writing about schools in Nicholas Nickleby, the abuses of child labor in Oliver Twist, or his own childhood in David Copperfield, Dickens cared about and advocated for children. Tiny Tim is one of A Christmas Carol's most memorable characters, and Scrooge's transformation begins with the reminder of the neglect he suffered as a boy. Also, to loop in one part of the collaboration of this project, Second Life has a vibrant urchin community of role players who range over many sims. This community pops up in the steampunk sims of New Babbage and at the annual fantasy fair and many other places. I knew they could help me develop my ideas and indeed they did. I am a tinkerer. I can build and script just enough to be dangerous. I'm also a writer and instructional designer and all of these skills were absolutely needed to create the urchin experience. Did I know how to script a game of this kind? No, absolutely not. I knew I would need help, and that help was generously given. I am lucky enough to count some excellent scripters among my SL friends, and they helped with ideas, critique, and in some cases, sample code. I want to give Builders Brewery a shout out as well. This incredibly generous community patiently answered my questions about techniques 
and specifics and tracking down errors. This group is well known for assisting builders from novice to expert. In addition to getting questions answered in group chat, a few builders reached out to me personally with detailed assistance. This project would not exist without their support. So this is a, um, I'll add an extra comment here, particularly in light of what Val and Bree have been sharing, which is that we as educators, we as librarians bring content and content structuring tools. And one of the key supports we need to enlist and develop are the technical skills within Second Life and other virtual worlds about how to realize, how to instantiate, how to create the structures that we know work, like in immersive learning and immersive engagement, and bring them into this environment. As I mentioned, the urchin community in Second Life makes up skilled role players, as well as experienced builders and scripters. Several members of that community also offered ideas and critiques of the project as it developed. The Shanaki Library community also helped. Our community of readers and writers and lovers of literature includes people from varied backgrounds and amazing skills who are ready to help bring stories alive here in Second Life. So the proof is in the pudding. How did this actually work? How did people participate in the urchin experience? You land at the Dickens Project in the Central Plaza and notice an information kiosk. There's a panel you can click on for a HUD. You click and receive a folder of information and objects that includes a titler, if you want your urchin to have a unique name, and the HUD you wear that guides and tracks your experiences. You can find things, coins on the street, treasure on the mucky shores of the Thames, where mudlarks scoured the tidal flats for whatever washed up. You can earn a few coins by sweeping the sidewalk in front of a shop or singing a holiday carol. You can use your coins to buy food, or in urchin fashion, you can steal and hope you don't get caught. Participants were invited to create outfits that included shapes, clothing, and props, with some provided free on the sim. Consistent with the experiences of poor children in Dickens' time, things did not always go well. Sometimes you got caught and lost everything you had and had to start again. Participants did come away with gifts, along with a new appreciation for what poor children faced. They were also invited to write stories about what they experienced and imagined. So this past season of the Dickens Project was the first time I did anything like this ever, and we incorporated it into the Dickens Project. What did we learn? As the designer and creator, I'm very pleased to report that the game worked. My code did not fail me. Those early critiques succeeded in finding the worst of the bugs. Working with the urchin community was a delight. The adults who role play the usually scruffy children of various times and places are historians, creators, and role players of skill and generosity. Choosing this focus created a solid basic structure we can expand. And we plan to expand. The urchin experience will be back with more. More experiences, more options, more bells and whistles, and more characters to be created and explored. And here I will end my presentation and turn the platform and the mic back over to Val for questions. Great. Thank you so much, Eva. Um, 
I think this really illustrates how important it is to bring our own unique perspectives into virtual worlds and then share and connect and collaborate. So if you have any questions, really for any each, each one of us about our role or anything like that, you can type it in, in chat. And, uh, and we'll also type that in, in chat, the answers to the questions, so we can keep our, our chat um, our chat going. Did anybody have a question? Be thinking about that. Or a comment about how how um, collaboration from your perspective has uh, has helped you. Because I know we're all we all have unique talents and, and gifts to share here. And I've worked with several of you in the audience on projects. You've certainly helped me with the, the different skills that I lack because we all have different skills. And I think uh, I really enjoyed hearing a little bit more about the building process since I, I know basic building, but not I'm not really a builder. And also hearing about game design because those interactive um, experiences are so important in virtual worlds. It's not just to come in and see a slideshow that you could see online, but it's to come in and interact with, you know, with the environment itself. Absolutely, and don't forget if you uh, if this was interesting to you, be thinking about. There's tons and tons of way, things to research about the Victorian era, um, and its impact really on you know culture as well as on Charles Dickens' life. We don't have a lot really on his life at the at the um, research center. So, and it's it, you know it doesn't have to be a huge research project, even if it's just a few slides um, to to add. We really want to have a rich. Um, research center there for people who are interested in uh, in Dickens and his work. Oh yes, Buffy. Thanks for mentioning that. As I said, um, Jody Landon, that's Bree here. She um, designed and built the nonprofit Commons Resource Library, and there will be a summer event there. So be thinking about that. Um, to, we really want to add more content for nonprofits so that they can. Um, find uh, and, we, and we can curate things virtually uh, and make that an interactive and very useful space for nonprofits. We thought about starting a new project. Um, okay, I see one question for Eva there. Are you ask and, and I wonder if about the uh, about the project. Did the sim include real historical characters for the time or stick to Dickens characters? And also, the people who come uh, just come as uh, characters usually dressed in historical attire. It's not mandatory, but a lot of people like to do that to try to find, you know, a Victorian era um, clothing to wear. One of the highlights of the Dickens Project is the Big Read. The Big Read is when the entire um, story of Christmas Carol is read aloud, and that always is an annual really fun event if you haven't attended. And another one that is always fun is the Fezziwig Ball, because we all know that Fezziwig is the character who knew how to keep Christmas, and so it's always a big fun dance you know, party in Second Life to come to the Fezziwig Ball in December. There are things like a, a horse and carriage ride, your, a horse ride around uh, with the sound effects, all to set that immersive tone of uh, the holiday feel uh, in London at that time. Just checking to see if there's any other questions in chat that we might have missed. Uh, one thing I might point out, the Dickens Project is a great thing to use to introduce um, administrators, faculty, teachers, librarians, if you want to bring them in and show them Second Life, because right away they, un they understand, oh, I'm entering a book. 
I'm entering a his history. I'm, you know, rather than just reading a Christmas Carol, you're entering. So it's, it's, it's a, you might think about, you know, if there's someone you've been wanting to show Second Life, it's a great way to do that. Um, Caledonia and Shawnee Library, they do have other, they have a, um, a lot going on in Kitely, but I believe for now, Aoife, can you answer that? I believe for now the Dickens Project is only in Second Life. Uh, they have had, Shawnee Library has um, has tried something real unique, and I, I'm sh maybe there's somebody else who's done it, but the first time I ever went to an event, they have simul simultaneously had an event in both Second Life and in Kitely at the Shawnee Library, a live, like a live storytelling type event. So um, that's that's pretty interesting to be able to be in, in, in two worlds at one time. Yes, sharing readings across um, simultaneously. And Shawnee Library is a really great example of a virtual world library with, with a specific focus. Their entire focus is on live oral storytelling. And, and that's really, you know, the Dickens Project has a lot of live readings that go on. But, um, and, and that's, they, they have a huge following of people who like to come and, and do readings and tell stories to bring literature to life. Um, right. Aoife just, uh, just answered that question. It's not, um, partnered with that Santa Cruz physical world Dickens project. There's a lot of Dickens projects across the country. Um, one that we featured at the research center was in Galveston. There's Dickens on the Strand and people come, you have to book a hotel a long time in advance. It's really popular. They dress in historical attire and they, you know, do the caroling and they do a lot of reenactments there in Galveston. Another um, thing I think we've illustrated here is the importance in virtual worlds to collaborate across communities. Um, we are not in competition here. You know, the, the community virtual library is not in competition with other libraries. We want to highlight other libraries and feature them. Our goal is to connect communities and support them and enrich them, not take people away from communities. So um, the more we can do that, the better. And I think um, our project here illustrates that. We, we want to enhance what Shawnee Library is doing with live storytelling events while we still have librarians that are focused on other things, academic resources or specific exhibits. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's really cross community events really um, are great in virtual worlds because they, um, they advocate and validate what educators are doing. Oh, and I'm glad Elise mentioned that. Elise did a great presentation at Dickens and is very interested in um, that accuracy and authenticity of historical attire. I'm hoping she'll build on that next year because it was awesome. It really led to a discussion on what's important about wearing the accurate clothes of the time. How do I get those accurate clothes of the time? And then, so her two niches, as she's talking about niches, are really archival and then authenticity and accuracy. She had, she had one research project on um, curation in those times. How did they curate Dickens' work, you know, back in, you know, circa 1936 or whatever, and compared to how we um, curate and archive our, our work now? And it leads to thinking, what's going to happen to all these digital assets that we're creating? Can we archive them for the future? Um, so it's, you know, there's a lot of things that relate when you bring in that historical time to our time and the resources that we share.
And when she um, adds that information about historically accurate clothing and being authentic, what, what we want to do as librarians is get that information out into the hands of educators because so many times you have your little group on your sim and you don't even realize that other people out there have these great things to share with you. And so that's why we want to have our virtual world database so you can connect with other communities and not keep trying to reinvent the wheel, feeling frustrated that you're all alone in a virtual world, you know, with a handful of people. So um, contact Elise here. She's the assistant director of CVL. If you are interested in um, our virtual world database and sharing your work in that database or your virtual world communities. Um, yes, Elise is ahead of me. She's already put the, the, the link out there. Um, there's a, there's a, um, a, go, a form that you can fill out to add your community and we want this to grow and it, it'll take a lot of us to make it grow. If you're interested at all in helping, um, contact Elise because some roles that we need are people to go make sure some of these landmarks still exist. Nothing worse, worse than going to a ghost town or a, you know, a, a sim that's no longer there. It's changed into something else. We, we want to keep it up to date and that takes, you know, some volunteers. And um, also we need people who want to maybe do entries into the database, things like that. It's finding, you know, your, your role as a volunteer, something you really like to do. You can contact us later. We have tons of fun opportunities if anyone wants to volunteer at the Community Virtual Library. Um, and as I said, it's always matching the person to what they love to do anyway. If it's connecting with your community, you know, contact me later because we have ways that we can connect our communities. We've recently partnered with Caledon and we do a literary study once a month with Caledon. It's been really, really fun to partner with another um, uh, another community to do that. We partner with ISTE, with the Virtual Pioneers, with the Nonprofit Commons, you know, a lot of the different educational groups. Of course, Rockcliffe. Rockcliffe has been amazing in supporting our new library, the Hypergrid Library. And I mentioned earlier, their, their virtual world library at Rockcliffe on Abacon is absolutely amazing. If you have not visited, I could just hang out there all day. <laughs> it's awesome. Yes, uh, Jody says, just plummeting into the abyss, a sim disappears, and it's it's weird. It's very much like going to a place in the real world and feeling kind of sad when it's all shriveled up and, you know, it's just a ghost town, but uh, especially if you were, you know, actively involved with a place like that. We also have a little object that gives out the database. If if you're interested in that, you can IM me or Elise. Um, you can put it at your SIM, and people just click on it, and it tells them how to add communities and and things to the to the um to the community virtual library virtual database. Yes, there's a there's a great exhibit here for um, the Rock Cliff Library. Uh, if you see that, and and it, it the, the bigger one is in Avacon, the one that I told you, it's just amazing. Oh, thanks for sharing that, Mel. <clears throat> oh, or um, Merlin, sorry. Their blog, great. Yes, the Avaton, uh, the Avacon library is, is huge, and they've graciously given us some space to collaborate and connect our hypergrid resource library, so we can um, point more people to their. I call it an academic research library because it's very high quality academic resources there. 
um, and our, the hypergrid resource library is really to help help us all learn how to navigate all these spaces. It's not easy to have multiple avatars and you know different grid ad, you know addresses and and, and uh, so many different groups. But if we um, if we help each other uh, navigate that path, I think it will be much more successful. I thought I saved a landmark to the Rock Cliff Library exhibit here at uh, Virtual World's Best Practice in Education, but I'm not I'm not sure what it's called, so I don't want to hand out the wrong landmark. But but that it's a great exhibit that really shares a lot about the Rock Cliff um, Virtual Library. Great, Buffy. I love to see that coming together. Educators, nonprofits, libraries, all, uh, all being connected and pointing to each other rather than being, you know, isolated and, and lonely in a virtual space. Oh, and um, Zinnia, just, that just reminds me when you said we're all in this together. Um, the nonprofit commons sometimes strives to have cross community events. And this conference certainly is the best example of that. You find communities that you didn't even know existed in virtual worlds for education. And the more you could, when we have an event, if we can invite other communities, that's where we get success and we get validation of the kind of work that we're doing and share with other educators. Um, is Beth still here? Beth's really good at cross communication. We all, we all try to give our note cards to Beth because she's great at sharing them. Communication is difficult because there's so many communication channels. I know some of you are, were kind of, you know, bummed that Google Plus suddenly dissolved when we, a lot of people had spent time building great you know, community networking on Google Plus, and then it disappeared. Not everyone's on Facebook or Twitter. Not everyone is in the same virtual world groups um, or listservs of email. So, you know, promoting our events and getting the word out is really a challenge. And I think that would be a great presentation for next year, you know, as somebody to really try to tackle that challenge. And I know um, many of you are going to want to teleport over to the keynote. Um, and I'm just so happy that you all came to hear this example of virtual world collaboration, because all of you are great collaborators and, and really understand that, that point. <laughs> Thank you.